Good evening, Dr. Robi. Good evening, Max. Uh, good, good morning, evening. Max. Yeah, sorry. Good morning. It is, uh, oh, thank you. Yeah, early in the morning, your uh, local time. It is very early. Thank you. Okay. How are you? Do how are you doing, Max? I'm fine, and I hope the same for all of you. Uh, okay. Uh, I believe they uh, good evening. Good evening. Uh, good evening to you, and and uh, hope hope you are all well. Good evening, Doctor Robby. Yes, good evening. Good evening, Doctor Hotma. Yeah, good the host please turn off the music Good evening, Professor Gregory Siotone. Good evening. Uh, how are you doing, Professor Siotone? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. How are you? Yeah, I, I'm fine. Just fine. And how about the pandemic situation in your uh, country? Uh, well, we're experiencing a second surge. So we're oh, okay. here in Boston. Mm -hmm. uh, how are you? How's your situation? Yeah, we uh, uh, we are still trying to flatten the curve. But, yeah, uh, yeah, it's uh, not easy. Eh? It's a hard thing. It is. It is. Uh, thank you for your uh, participation and contribution. <laughs> it's to, my pleasure. Yeah, thank you for inviting. Me. Good evening, Professor Sulfas. Professor Sulfas, are you on the line? We will get started in uh, uh, four minutes. <clears throat> Where is the head office of the uh, Vadam, uh, Professor Shiotone? 
Uh, well, Wadham is um, incorporated in Wisconsin in the United States. Um, and that's so technically that's where the, the head office is. But um, we stretch around the world. There's a, a large presence um, in Australia, for instance. And, um, but the, the headquarters itself is actually in Wisconsin. Uh, So I think nowadays, uh, Wadham uh, got more consultations uh, based on the pandemic situation, how to overcome it. Yes, yeah, we're, we're very busy. Though we don't do consultation technically. Uh, we're very much um, uh, an organization that promotes education and research. So it's a, it's a, a way to collect uh, scientists in the emergency and disaster services around the world to have uh, a forum to conduct research and, and collaborate scientifically. Good evening, Professor Paul Tahalili. Uh, Prof. Paul, are you on the line? Good afternoon, Professor George Zulfas. Good evening, Professor Hendy. Professor Hendy Hendarto, are you on the line? Good evening, Dr. Peter. Oh, yeah. Good How are you everybody. doing? <laughs> Good to see you all. Yeah. <laughs> Stay healthy and safe. Stay safe. Still busy with uh, operations? <laughs> no, no, no. Yes. I'm free now. <laughs> Good evening, Dr. Franz Arifin. Dr. Franz, are you on the line? Yes, Dr. Peter, I'm sorry, I cannot yeah. unmute myself, so... Uh... Oh, it's, it's great. <laughs> Very sorry that I cannot uh, arrange my virtual background. I don't know what's wrong. Use usually it works, but now it doesn't. Good evening, Professor Paul Tahalili. Prof. Paul Tahalili, are you on the line? Good evening, Professor Puruhito. Good afternoon, Professor Georges Tulfas. Professor Zulfas, are you on the line? Well, I think we will uh, we will get started at the moment. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, and welcome uh, 
to the 10th chapter of Surgical Forum of the International College of Surgeon Indonesia section. Uh, first of all, I would like uh, to welcome all of the participants, particularly our guest speakers uh, from Wadham, Professor uh, Gregory Shuton, and the other speaker, uh, Dr. Ch Colonel Dr. Cahya Nurobi from the TNE Surgeon General Office and Dr. Hotma Banjarnahor from the Papi Disaster Tax Force. Uh, my name is Dr. Peter John Manopo, General Surgeon Fix from the ICS Indonesia section. And I will be your uh, moderator in this event. Besides, I'm the coordinator of the uh, surgical forum of ICS Indonesia section. And also uh, welcome and thank you for Professor George Solfas, the world president of IC the ICS in in International College of Surgeons. Uh, Mr. Max Downham, the global CEO of the International College of Surgeons, and all the Indonesian office bearers, Professor Paul Tahlili, the section president, uh, Professor Hendy Hendarto, the scientific vice president, Dr. Francisco Arifin, the secretary of the Indonesia section, Professor uh, Puruhito, the expertise board of ICS Indonesia section, and all participants. So uh, we come to the opening session. And for the first opportunity, I would like to invite Professor Paul Tahalili, the president of the Indonesia section. Professor Paul Tahalili. Uh, time is yours. Professor Paul Talili, are you on the line? Okay, uh, maybe later on. I will uh, skip to Professor Hendy Hendarto. Professor Hendy Endarto, the time is yours to deliver your scientific notice. Thank you, Dr. Peter. Good evening, everybody. Good morning and good afternoon. Welcome and thank you for joining the Surgical Forum Chapter 10, the International College of Surgeon Indonesian Section. I would like to express my deepest gratitude and appreciation to the Professor Paul Dahlili, Mr. Mac Downham, Professor Judges so fast, and also the speaker, uh, uh, Professor Jejuri of Siotone, sorry, Colonel Dr. Cahya Nurobi and Dr. Hotma Banjar Nahor, Professor Buruhito, and also Dr. Peter, Dr. Fran, and all webinar participants. Ladies and gentlemen, Ladies and gentlemen, uh, all webinar participants, scientific note today is about message from the Pan American Health Organization uh, regarding the disaster management in the pandemic. There are three important goals of successful disaster management in the pandemic. One, first, as uh, having a strong enough organizational structure to manage a pandemic. The second, and continually identify resources plan and respond and implement under the plan. And the last, keep the number of death up to a minimum. That's all I think about the message from disaster management in the pandemic on the scientific notes. I hope we all stay healthy and stay safe. And finally, thank you for all the speakers for sharing your experience. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Hendarto, for your opening speech. 
And now I would like to invite Professor Paul Tahlele. Professor Paul Tahlele, the floor is yours. Well, I will uh, skip to Professor uh, Georgius Zulfas. Professor Zulfas, the time is yours. Good afternoon, and uh, uh, thank you for the privilege and honor of being here with you today. Um, I would like to congratulate uh, once again the ICS Indonesian section for putting together this very important webinar, uh, putting this very important series of webinars together. And uh, in our days with the pandemic, having any educational effort is, is really critical and very important for surgeons of all generations. And uh, the one good thing with webinars is they can be seen from all around the world. Um, this one is especially important because of its theme, the disaster relief. And uh, it's a very important topic. It's things we, a lot of things we didn't see, we'd see in our lifetime and yet we're dealing with enemies, some of them that we can see, others that we cannot see, all of them equally dangerous. And I see that there is an excellent panel today from all around the world. Um, so again, congratulations, um, uh, Dr. Manopo and the whole Indonesian section for really putting uh, together an excellent <laughs> webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Giorgio Solfas, the world president of the International College of Surgeon. Uh, for the next opportunity, I would like to invite uh, Professor Paul Tahlele. Professor Paul Talele, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, I will skip to the next uh, speakers. I would like to invite Mr. Max Downham, uh, the world CEO of the International College of Surgeons. Uh, Mr. Downham, the time is yours. I thank you, uh, Dr. Manopo, for your introduction and for your serving as coordinator uh, of this wonderful webinar. Uh, World President uh, Professor George Sufas, um, Professor Paul Tahalehi, uh, Dr. Hindarto, Pierre Rohito, uh, Dr. Arifin, um, distinguished speakers. Uh, it's my also my privilege and honor to address you briefly this uh, this evening, uh, and it, it it's um, noteworthy. It seems to me that um, at a time of the year, at the end of 2020, uh, which has been challenging in I think many many respects around the world, um, that disaster relief, uh, which at least in part uh, is part of the International College of Surgeons. It's what the ICS is all about. And the founding of Dr. Max Thorak um, 85 years ago was based upon um, under building understanding and, uh, and conveying international goodwill. Uh, and it is uh, as true today as it was 85 years ago. Um, it is an uh, inclusive, um, uh, organization, the ICS, in terms of being open to all races, creeds, nationalities. We are apolitical. Uh, and so it's, it seems to me that it is most appropriate uh, and very pertinent, very relevant that um, the ICS uh, is sponsoring this session on disaster relief. Again, disaster relief, uh, at least in my my brief definition here is helping people in need uh, who have urgent needs. And so I, I also commend um, the Indonesian section leadership um, in terms of sponsoring this webinar on disaster relief and certainly the preceding uh, webinars as well. So Dr. Manopo, I thank you and all of the leadership of the Indonesian section um the uh for being for sponsoring this and and devoting the efforts to do so and with that i thank you so much thank you very much uh, mr max downham for your ics updates 
Uh, and now I would like to invite the president of WADEM as our distinguished guest speaker in this session, uh, Professor Gregory Siotun, uh, the president of WADEM. Uh, the time is yours. Thank you, Professor Manopo. Uh, and also thank you for the International College of Surgeons for uh, inviting me to speak at this very important conference. It is my pleasure to do so. It's also my pleasure to represent uh, the World Association for Disaster and Emergency Medicine um, at, this, at this important event. We all have been um, united in our struggle this year uh, against the COVID-19 virus and one of the greatest public health disasters and challenges uh, we have seen in over a century. Um, however, we've also seen the disasters that we uh, uh, respond to um, uh, on an annual basis also occur, and in some cases at record levels. In the, in the Caribbean, we have seen the most active hurricane season that we have seen in, her, in recorded history. Um, and we've seen many other both uh, accidental, natural, and man-made disasters occur. So disaster medicine really unites all of us in the healthcare specialties. And that's why conferences like this, uh, the International College of Surgeons Indonesian section um, on disaster relief is so important. It's important to have us all come together as healthcare providers, as physicians and surgeons, uh, and discuss how best to respond to disasters, particularly in this now COVID and then soon to be post COVID uh, environment, how is disaster response uh, done and done differently? There are things that we do uh, uh, routinely for disaster response that we have to modify and can't do the same way anymore. We rely very heavily on shelters, sheltering, we rely hev heavily for large scale natural disasters on international disaster teams, which I'll speak about uh, in a moment. Uh, but we have to do that differently now in the, in the COVID era. Um, so we have to really take a step back and look at this and see how we do prepare and respond to disasters in this time. So again, thank you for putting together this very important conference. On behalf of the World Association for Disaster and Emergency Medicine, uh, it's my pleasure to speak um, at this conference. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Gregory Siotun, uh, for your speech. And now I would like to invite Professor Paul Tahalili. Professor Paul Tahalili, the time is yours. Uh, we will skip to the next. I would like to invite uh, Dr. Franz Arifin to uh, deliver about the section issues. Dr. Franciscus Arifin, the time is yours. Uh, thank you, Dr. Peter, uh, for the opportunity. Uh, I'm sharing my screen. Is it? Uh, is it? Uh, can you view it? Yes, uh, it's quite clear. This, this, yes. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Peter, for the time. So um, I will take uh, only just to uh, introduce our members and uh, uh, maybe uh, the participants of the activities of the International College of Surgeon in the humanitarian uh, surgery missions and uh, disasters. So uh, basically, essential surgical care is uh, the same uh, flip side of the disaster and emergency uh, surgery. It's a different side of the same coin because uh, we know that all the uh, uh, equipment and uh, facilities and uh, uh, technical skills that is needed for the essential surgical care is just the same as what is needed in the uh, disaster and uh, emergency uh, surgery. So uh, uh, this is the definition of humanitarian surgery, which is uh, part of the uh, main part of the International College of Surgeon activities, which is serving the greatest number of unserved people possible, regardless of their ability to pay. So uh, this is just the same as the purpose for the uh, emergency and uh, disaster surgery. Uh, our model of the humanitarian surgery is uh, this, but I would not uh, delve uh, deeper because uh, no, no, no. the time limit. So I would just 
just to show you that uh, uh, the ICS, the Indonesian sections, and the world uh, ICS has uh, served the humanitarian surgery models and uh, disaster relief in uh, many uh, activities, uh, such as uh, these slides. This is our, our activities in Ambon uh, about uh, two or three years ago. I'm, I forgot uh, the time, the exact time. And this is the last year mission to the uh, uh, Paraguay and Guatemala. And uh, this is the activity uh, in uh, Nigeria. I think uh, Mr. Max Downham is uh, uh, very uh, familiar with these activities uh, around the world. So as a part of the effort to, uh, to sustain the uh, disaster and humanitarian surgery all over the world, the International College of Surgeon is the member of the G4 Alliance. This is the Alliance for the Global uh, Global Alliance for Surgical Obstetric Trauma and Anesthesia Care. And as a member of this alliance, uh, we meet uh, several times and uh, uh, sit down and uh, discuss the uh, uh, major public health issues uh, uh, and uh, humanitarian uh, surgery all over the world. Uh, I think there is a short introduction for the humanitarian surgery and disaster surgery that is performed by the International College of Surgeon. Uh, thank you very much for your attention and your time. I return thank you the very time much. to uh, the moderator. Yes, Dr. Peter. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Francisco Arifin, for your section updates. And now we come to the scientific session. And for the first speaker, I would like to invite Colonel uh, Dr. Cahyano Robi from the TNE, uh, Surgeon General Office, to deliver uh, his presentation. Dr. Cahyano Robi, the time is yours. Uh, thank you, Dr. Peter, for your introductions. Now I'm, I will share my presentations. Um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, professor, colleagues, everybody. Thank you for inviting me for this uh, important occasion. And so I will present the topic about military disaster management in Indonesia. Um, I am a Colonel Dr. Nurobi. I work in the JNI Surgeon General Office, and I am also a hand orthopedic surgeon. Uh, so I will uh, uh, talking about this content. So as introduction. So we all know about the classification of a disaster. There are natural and unnatural disaster. In Indonesia, we have uh, so many uh, natural disaster than unnatural. But we also know about the social disaster and the other classification is complex disasters like uh, war. And we also know about disaster management cycle, the prevention and preparedness that's uh, before the state that before the disaster and the response and recovery that the cycle uh, after the disaster. You can see the pictures on the right sides. So, point of view, you cannot avoid the disaster. They just mitigate, especially for natural disaster. So how about the unnatural disaster? I think the same thing. Then the, the question is, can human predict? So the answer is uh, some of them can predict, but some of them cannot. So talking about the predictions, you can see the uh, 
time exchange in 2070. In that time, they're talking about the warning that we are not ready for the next pandemic. And now in 2020, the pandemic occur and we are not ready for it. So let me talk about the military role in disaster. Why military um, involved in disaster? Because the military has specific capability. They fast moving, working in 24 hours a day and seven days in week, well equipped, well trained, chain of command. And the important one is militant. The militancy is very important. For example, it is not easy to send the team to the certain located area with the difficulty to reach the location. But with the militancy, we can uh, send the team to the area. The role of military in disaster in the past, military is the first line, but now uh, many countries have a national disaster agency. In Indonesia, we have a BNPB. So military just supporting national disaster agency. How about the future? I think this, this uh, uh, supporting national disaster agency still, still can be uh, hold until probably 10 to 20 years uh, ahead. At the present, there is a trend toward the transformation of threats and transformation of war. What's the transform transformation of threats and what is transformation of war? I will talk about uh, the next slides. But uh, this transformation caused the transformation of the main task of the TNI. That's uh, in the Indonesian law number 34, 2004, it said that there are two main tasks of TNI, doing the military operation of war and military operation other than war. So according to the White Book of Indonesian Defense 2050, we have a several type of threats. Those are military threat, unmilitary threat, and hybrid. Hybrid means the combination with military and unmilitary threats. So how about the COVID-19? The COVID-19, according to the White Book of Indonesian Defense 2015, we collect to the unmilitary threats. So uh, the other classification we have is the real threat and unreal threat. So COVID-19 is the real unmilitary threat and specifically is a biological threat. So what is transformation of war or transformation of warfare? So um, we have a many transformations since the first generation of war in the, in the Greek and Roman uh, empire. And then the second generation of war, when uh, the first world war, when um, we, find, we found the uh, communications and a weapon. And the third generations of war, when we found the uh, missile, and the ballistic uh, atomic missile. And uh, right now we face the fourth generation of war when uh, we have uh, the asymmetric warfare, meaning that um, uh, both sides actually not equal. Uh, for example, um, a Vietnam war that the US with uh, uh, face the Vietnam with the less number of the troops, so we can call it asymmetric warfare. And talking with asymmetric warfare, we have to know about the proxy warfare. What is proxy warfare? The proxy warfare if, is if um, one side 
not um, not come from the country. I mean, uh, this is the non-state actor. For example, ISIS. This is a proxy warfare because ISIS is not um, representing the country. How about the biology warfare? The biology warfare uh, goes into the asymmetric warfare or fourth generation. The next generation of warfare is the uh, cyber warfare or fifth generation warfare. So if the combination of the biology warfare and cyber warfare, we can see the bio cyber warfare that actually exists in our life right now. So biology threat actually comes from bioweapon and they can uh, go to biology warfare, bioterrorism, biocrime, biodesert and impact to politics, economy, social culture, security and health. This is the um, same uh, with the uh, COVID pandemic right now. So what is the TNI role in disaster management in Indonesia? As I mentioned that there are uh, two uh, Indonesian uh, law, the number 24 and number 34. The first law talking about disaster response that mentioned that the BNPB as a national disaster agency, as a national coordinator. And the second law mentioned that the, there are two main tests of TNI that I mentioned before. The humanitarian assistance disaster relief, in, um, that's uh, uh, including to the uh, military operation other than war. How the TNI, TNI disaster preparedness and readiness? So when the uh, commander in chief ordered to uh, prepare the a team to the local located area or disaster area, so the team has to ready no more than two hours. That the SOP. Then they transfer immediately by air, sea, and land as well as the hospital field. Then the hospital field has to ready to operate no more than two hours after landing. Uh, beside, beside that, uh, we also coordinate with local medical facility. In case of the probably uh, healthcare facility can use as a, as a hospital or probably um, the medical facility has been damaged. In other uh, rule, the military personnel can also as a, a person as a disaster fit identification, morphology, and also odontology. This picture um, show when the Air Asia tragedy. Um, and uh, um, in right now, we have a five hospital uh, field in, in the five medical battalion which is uh, in army, we have a two Kostrad medical battalion, Navy, we have two Marine medical battalion and Air Force, we have one uh, Air Force headquarters medical battalion. In the future, we will add more three medical battalion in each services and one medical battalion each Kodam or military area command. So totally we have 24 medical battalion. How about the hospital ship? Right now we have two hospital ship, uh, KRI Dr. Suharso and KRI Semarang. But we have one hospital ship under reconstruction. Hopefully next, uh, next year, the hospital ship will operate and under the third fleet command. 
The medical team capabilities have a many capabilities uh, like a special force. Uh, they also has a common wing, scuba diver, static fall, a free fall, as well as ATLS, ACLS. And each medical personnel have a different medical kit. We have it's like the battalion kit, doctor kit, nurse kit, and also personal kit for the soldier. I will show you the experience in ADR or uh, humanitarian assistance disaster relief in 2018. We have three major disasters in Lombok, Palu, and Banten. In Lombok, we have an earthquake. In Palu, we have a combination of earthquake, tsunami, and liquefactions. And Banten have a, a tsunami. Both, uh, I mean, uh, three of them have a uh, different different location a different uh, type of a disaster and we have to prepare and send the team in the locations just uh, between between a disaster is just only one month so lombo at in the early of the 2018 until uh, April, then a uh, July, we uh, September we have uh, Palu and then a Banten tsunami in the December 2018. How about now in 2020? We have a big pandemic, COVID-19. Uh, disaster. So since a uh, March, JNI has already evacuated and quarantined of 238 Indonesian from Wuhan, and then uh, um, 188 Indonesian World Dream Seamen and 68 Diamond Princess Seamen in Sebaru Island. Then after that, Commander in Chief ordered to provide 199 hospital as COVID referral hospital. And uh, President Jokowi ordered to prepare the COVID-19 hospital in Wisma Atlet, Jakarta. Right now, I'm working in the Wisma Atlet as the chief of secretary. Be beside the Wisma Atlet, we have to prepare the Galang Island uh, hospital, COVID hospital, and the Indonesia, uh, I'm in, in Indrapura, Surabaya, COVID-19 hospital. Another uh, role is joined with ministry, local government, and private to overcome the economic burden for community to support the implementation of President Rule of PSBB and support the Kampung Tangguh or Kampung Siaga COVID movement and the final Final rule as joined with local government implementing the president instructions for health protocol, joined with uh, police. As uh, you see in the uh, screen, that I have a different uh, uh, COVID 19 hospital in China, India, and Indonesia. In China, uh, we ha uh, they have a Wuhan uh, COVID-19 hospital, which construct in just only two weeks with 2,000 beds capacity and 100, uh, 1,200 medical staff. And right now, the the uh, hospital is completed. But in India. They converted from uh, Bangalore International Exhibition Center, located in Beng Bangalore, with 10,000 bed capacity, still operating until now. In in Indonesia, we con converted Wisma Athlete or Athlete Village Sea Games, and we prepare in less than two weeks with 6,000 bed capacity and 2,500. 500 medical staff, and right now we're still operating. Um, 
this is a various activity and at the Wisma athlete uh, and also I, I will show you this is the ceremony uh, at the heroes days Hari Pahlawan uh, the uh, uh, 10 of November that we we using the hazmat all the uh, participant so as a conclusion military still needed in disaster management there is a transformation in disaster threat into a biological disaster. TNI has a specific role for supporting national disaster agency in disaster management in Indonesia. Civil military collaboration is needed in disaster management, including in disaster plan. I think that's all my presentation. Terima kasih. Thank you very much. Back to you, Dr. Thank, Peter. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Cahya Nurobi, for your informative presentation and now i would like to invite uh, the president of wadam professor gregory siotone uh, to deliver his presentation on disaster relief team professor siotone the time is yours thank you very much professor monopo and again thank you for allowing me to speak at this important conference Please allow me to share my screen. You can see that okay? Yes, clearly. Uh, please expose in a full screen. Yes, thank you. Okay, very good. So again, thank you so much for speaking at this, uh, allowing me to speak at this conference. Um, and I, uh, on behalf of the World Association for Disaster and Emergency Medicine, um, wish you to have a good uh, continuing conference webinar and all the great work that, um, that you do with your society. I'd like to talk a little bit now about disaster medicine field teams. Uh, I'll give you some uh, experience that I personally have as the commander of one of these teams, a disaster medical assistance team here in the United States, uh, and some of my experience commanding the first federal disaster team into ground zero 9-11. Uh, but first, let me talk a little bit about disaster. Um, disasters can be many things in many places. Uh, it can be both something as large as the 9-11 attacks, uh, as large as the tsunami, the Southeast Asia tsunami, as large as the Haitian earthquake, but it can also be as small as a bus accident in the rural area. And why is that? Uh, that is because a disaster by definition is something that overwhelms the local resources. So a small bus accident in a relatively rural area with very minimal healthcare capacity can be termed a disaster because it has overwhelmed the resources, uh, just as a large scale disaster has in other places. We have to understand also what a disaster is in the context of emergencies and crises. We deal with emergencies and crises all the time. I'm an emergency physician, uh, so I deal with many emergencies and personal patient crises all the time. But it's when a crisis goes to a disaster that we have to operate somewhat differently. And, and when a crisis goes to a disaster, by defi definition, it means that it is beginning to and is overwhelming the local resources. And that's when we have to act a little bit differently. We've seen that now with COVID-19 in the way that we implement crisis standards of care. So we lower our standards just a little bit so that it can provide the most good for the most people. Use of alternate care sites like field hospitals, um, uh, as we just saw in the last presentation, is an example of all, um, uh, crisis standards of care. When we look at disaster response in the United States, really it evolved from advances that we saw in military medicine. Um, in the United States prior to uh, the 1980s, the, um, uh, most of the disaster response, in fact, almost entirely the disaster response was, was done by the military. Later on in the 80s uh, and then into the 90s, we developed a somewhat different system. But some of the processes that we took and some of the, the way that we do disaster medicine in the United States uh, really directly comes from military experience. There are differences, however. Military medicine really deals with um, young, healthy people. Uh, whereas in disaster medicine, we can have people very, very young, very, very old. We can have ill people, chronic illnesses, um, comorbidities. So it's a little bit of a different experience. But the overriding principle is in disaster medicine to bring as much care to uh, closer to uh, where the uh, event is happening. So as close to the disaster in this case that we can get um, adequate uh, health care, uh, the better we're going to do, the, the better the results are going to be as far as how we, how we operate. 
you saw in the last presentation the disaster cycle, and this is the way we work in disaster medicine. It's the idea of prevention, mitigation, and preparedness, which are pre-disaster activities. And then, of course, the disaster strikes, and we have response. And very importantly, we have recovery as well. It's in the recovery period that we take a look back at how we responded and decide what went right, what went wrong, and how can we improve how we did the response so that we can do it better next time. The problem is that we talk about disaster field teams. We have to understand that the data has shown and it historically has been proven out that regardless of where you might be on the planet, whether you're in a very populous area or you're in a very rural area, do not expect to get any significant organized uh, disaster uh, resources into your disaster um, in anything less than 48 to 72 hours. This has been proven out in disaster after disaster after disaster. So as we know, many disaster field teams exist. The UN has the, uh, and WHO has the emergency medical response teams or EMTs. Really, we should take emergency off of that name and it should just be medical teams because it's the acute phase of a disaster that's almost entirely dependent on local resources, local capacity. Significant field teams, field hospitals, disaster teams won't be getting into the disaster zone in anything less than 48 to 72 hours. Uh, and again, it's that time, that time period really when most of the acute injuries are happening and, and, and deaths. So the most morbidity and mortality that happens in most of these uh, disasters occurs in that early time. Uh, it's then that post-acute phase that the disaster teams can be most effective. And it's very important that we have them. We need to have emergency management. To organize all of this, we have to have emergency management because also by definition, the disaster is chaos and we have to bring it to organization. And the way we do that is we have emergency management or almost a way of commanding and controlling the disaster in place until we can bring the situation back to a more organized system. And this is a long thing to read here, but essentially it says that no longer can we just haphazardly respond to disasters. Uh, we have to prepare for them, we have to train for them, um, and we have to professionalize this idea of disaster medicine and disaster response. So really command and control the cornerstones of any kind of major incident management. So the way we come into even small events, that's a mass casualty incident, let's say, maybe it's a, a bus accident or there's an explosion um, in, in a city and we have an organized local response, even that must have some command and control into it, has to have that emergency management aspect. Certainly larger scale disasters have to have that as well. And as the COVID-19 pandemic is demonstrating, sometimes that command and control and the disaster response has to last for weeks, months or longer. <clears throat> There's something called a major incident medical management support system. And essentially that's a command and control system used primarily uh, in Europe and, and elsewhere in the world. In the United States, we use something called the incident command system, but they're very similar. And when you look at these systems, these command and control systems, really where healthcare comes in is this point of triage and treatment. Um, we have to get the, uh, the personnel in, we have to get the field hospitals in, the medical teams in uh, to be able to triage patients uh, effectively and quickly and to treat them, especially the life-threatening injuries first. So the principles of disaster triage are again to provide the most good for the most people. So it may be when you triage people in an acute disaster in a mass casualty incident, that there are some cases you might have to cover, uh, not provide care to some victims that are either already dead or expectant, meaning that despite all the care that you could provide to that, that patient, they have a very low likelihood of surviving, but you may have to then go and provide that care instead to more critically injured patients that if you don't provide that care will die. Um, however, if you do provide the care, you can save their lives. So disaster triage is a little bit different because um, time and resources are the problem. In a disaster, the needs can be up here, but the resources can be here. And by definition, that's the disaster. So you have to operate in a certain way in disaster triage until you can make that more equal. You can bring enough resources to equal the needs. There are some life-saving interventions, however, that have to happen very, very quickly. And of course, as surgeons, you understand all of these. So this is the part of the local infrastructure capacity that we talk about. We have to build capacity for disaster response on the local level, really anywhere in the world and everywhere in the world, so that these sorts of things can be, can be uh, treated quickly um, and, and lives can be saved. So that means you have to understand where you are and whether your responders have these skills. In some situations, your pre-hospital responders, EMS, they do these things all the time. 
In other cases, they don't, particularly in rural area EMS. So it may be that you have to do some more training and, and have them uh, better understand how to do field uh, emergency care. So field disaster operations involve a number of different things. One of them, and the most important one, is scene safety. When you set up your team, when you set up your operations, you have to have it in a safe place so that you and your team are safe. Um, and then you go through the process of activating your disaster system, and you may have to have specialized capabilities such as C. Bernie in intentional events or terrorist attacks, chemical, biologic, and radiation. All of these things have to be taken into account. So really the way we do it is a scalable, um, disaster response. So there's the local response. If that is overwhelmed, there's the, the state and regional response. If that's overwhelmed, then there's a national or federal response. So it has to be a scalable re response with different field teams. And the way that you're going to do that most efficiently is you're going to practice together. It's not good to have different agencies who typically don't work with each other meet for the first time in a disaster. You have to train together. You have to do drills, you have to work together. In the, in the United States Navy, they have a phrase called, we fight like we train and we train like we fight. That's what we have to do in disaster response. So the United States, the history of the National Disaster Medical System, which is what we operate under now, is this. It started in the 1980s, and after some uh, understanding of exactly how to create these teams, uh, 1987, uh, the NDMS was created. And really the, the, the main um, portion of NDMS and its activities revolve around the DMAT or Disaster Medical Assistance Team. I was the commander of a level one DMAT in the 1990s and into the early 2000s. I was commander of DMAT Massachusetts too. Um, these DMAT teams typically have a minimum of 35 people to deploy. Often we take more. When I went to ground zero in 9-11, I had 54 people on my team. <clears throat> we deploy within eight to 12 hours. We have doctors, nurses, EMTs, and paramedics, but we also have all other personnel for operations, logistics, communications, et cetera. The idea is that we can be completely self-sufficient in a disaster zone for 72 hours, and then with resupply of food, um, uh, fuel for the generators, water, we can be completely self-sufficient for two weeks. So let me tell you a little bit about my personal experience. Um, I've done a number of different disaster responses, but I was commander of Massachusetts 2 DMAT um, at the World Trade Center disaster. And my team was, was first activated because we were first on call for the Eastern Seaboard of the United States. Um, and we got into uh, New York City the evening of the 11th. And I'll just go through a little bit of what we did. Um, this is a picture actually of, of me on the command vehicle down in ground zero and my, one of my, um, two of my different IDs that I had to have there. But first what we did was we set up a command station. So a command um, uh, in field hospital work, you must have, again, that organization brought into the chaos. So the first thing that we did is we set up a command station and then began putting in our uh, response teams. And the five medical stations that we established um, in within ground zero were actually treating 400 patients per day. Um, that's not, not a lot of people understand that. These were, of course, the responders, but because ground zero was such a dangerous scene, and this is typical in early disaster response, wherever you respond, um, the scene typically is, is, is relatively dangerous early on until you can make it less dangerous. Um, but because of the different risks, and the different um, uh, injuries and, and problems that people were having, we were actually treating about 400 patients per day. Um, now, most of those were minor injuries, but we did have some major uh, uh, Ill illnesses and injuries as well. We've had strokes, we had heart attacks, we had penetrating abdominal trauma when people would slip and fall on rebar, we had burns when uh, pockets of fuel would ignite. Um, so we had a number of different casualties. This is a typical DMAT tent or field hospital tent. Really, the way these tents operate, and the way the DMAT system operates is like a mobile emergency department. Um, we actually don't have surgical capability in DMATs because the DMATs were made to deploy in the United States. And the thought being that regardless of where you deploy within the United States, you probably will have some degree of surgical capability in the local um, hospitals that are still uh, unaffected by the disaster. So they didn't build in surgical capability in this kind of field hospital, though many international field hospitals do have surgical capability. When you have surgical capability, as you know better than I, um, not only do you have to have that surgical capability, but you have to have that ability and capability to care for the patient afterwards, like intensive care unit type of uh, um, capability. So that makes your team a little bit larger, a little bit more comprehensive. So this, again, this is our typical DMAT team, and this is one of the DMAT um, uh, stations that we set up in Ground Zero. Um, during the phase that I was there for two weeks, it was the search and rescue phase, and that's the time when we saw about 2,200 patients um, with this sort of breakdown. 
as soon as it went from search and rescue to search and recovery, and this is when my team and I went home and other DMAT teams came and backfilled, um, it went from 400 patients per day that we were seeing to about 130 patients per day, which really is a testament to how hard and how much um, people were trying to get into the pile and try to get their, their colleagues out um, while they still had a chance um, and, and were still possibly alive. Of course, nobody was rescued from that pile. And these are just a couple more pictures of um, the way we converted, uh, in this case, uh, a, a deli, a, a small restaurant or deli, um, into a medical station as well in Ground Zero. Um, and this is a picture of some of the activities. One thing that happens in, in disaster zones um, often is search and rescue um, uh, uh, needs and search and rescue teams coming in. So there has to be some medical support in some cases for the search and rescue, which is what we did here. This is uh, one of the stations we had at Ground Zero, and that's me standing there with a pink mask on. So these sorts of activities uh, require a lot of organization. Um, when you go into these scenes, they're dangerous. Um, you have to understand that um, there's a lot of uh, uh, infrastructure that has to be put into place. So before you begin to even think about fielding a disaster team, there has to be a lot on the preparedness side of getting the capabilities, making sure people and uh, uh, personnel are trained well, make sure they understand how to practice in austere environments, and never forget the psychological burden of disaster response. Um, this is, again, some of my, my team members down at Crown Zero, uh, and you can see the psychological burden. And we've seen this with COVID-19 as well. Um, so always be able to address that and understand that in yourselves. Um, again, I had a brief uh, a chance here to talk a little bit about field disaster teams. I do appreciate uh, you having me speak at this important conference, and I look forward to uh, working with you uh, more in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Gregory Siotun, for your interesting presentation. Uh, for the next opportunity, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Hotma Banjarnahor uh, from the Papi Disaster Tax Force to deliver your presentation on surgery in disaster relief. Dr. Hotma, the time is yours. Okay, thank you, Dr. Peter. <coughs> okay. Good, more, uh, good evening, good afternoon, and good morning to the audience who present at this current webinar. Tonight, I would like to deliver you a topic about the role of a general surgeon in disaster management. This topic is, interest, is very interesting because as a general surgeon, we must also be able to assist in handling disaster that are around us or if we are needed. So, it is hope that all general surgeons can participate in disaster management in Indonesia. We all know that almost of Iceland in our country, Indonesia, have, an, have experienced various kind of national disaster, either caused by nature or caused by non-nature. Since 1965, according to records, there have been many natural disasters, and every year natural disasters always occur, appear in Indonesia. And on average, it results in more than 100 of casualties. For example, that occur due to natural disaster are flood or earthquake. This results in disruption of access to the disaster site. So, that the assistant that arrive is too late and has an impact on both casualties and material loss. This is a problem that often occur in the field of disaster management. Disaster can also be caused by non-nature. Apart from disease outbreaks in Indonesia, there are often mass casualties due to disputes between the two parties. This could be due to places between existing traps or the effect of places uh, between demonstrator and security force during demonstration. This thing also result in casualties as well as material loss. As a result of the disaster, many victims needed to be evacuated. So, it requires a lot of volunteers to help victims 
Sometimes it is often found that health facilities such as hospital cannot accommodate victims. So parking area are open field are used to help victims. From BNPB's data, it, it is found that the number of disaster that occur every year from 2017 to 2019 has increased. Likewise, the number of victims has also increased. And also in 2020 in Indonesia, there will also be a national disaster caused by the COVID-19 pandemic with cost many victims. Moreover, health workers are also affected, even many of which have resulted in death. Therefore, the President of the Republic of Indonesia, Joko Widodo, declared the COVID pandemic is a national disaster. Due to the large number of victims, several volunteers would uh, fill hospital to accommodate the victim. And sometimes the fail hospital is not very simple. We as uh, surgeons also take part in, the, in disaster management according to our competen competency. However, due to lack of good coordination, the assistant gift was sometimes left and also not on target. And also in the handling of victim in the field office, they often use the simple equipment available. Because of that, PABI, as an organization of the Association of Indonesia General Surgeon, is called to create a PABI Disaster Task Force, which aim to assist and aid disaster victims. In addition, the Disaster Task Force can coordinate members with related parties in disaster management. We know that in terms of disaster management, there are two important things, namely in terms of the disaster mitigation and also in terms of disaster responses. For this reason, the public disaster task force play a role during, during disaster preparation by preparing equipment and also human resource through training. During a disaster, the public disaster task force play a role in the handling of victims with the aim of stabilizing the condition of the victim, thus reducing the number of casualties. We know that in terms of disaster management, we must know the map of the location of the disaster that occurred so that uh, we can know the access and possibilities of victims who are arrest. Because besides of that, the identity and as a relief team must be clear. And also in term administration must also be accompanied by a letter of assignment. We serve to coordinate with related parties. We set equipment in disaster management. Previously, mapping had to be carried out on areas that are likely uh, to arise from disaster and their types as well as our progression of disaster management. If we, we look at the mapping map from the NPD, it appears that almost of all regions in Indonesia have the possibility of a disaster, both low and high degrees. Meanwhile, almost of area in Indonesia have experienced the tsunami, starting from 1820 in Sumbawa until the last one in 2018 in Central Sulawesi. And this take a lot of facility as well as material. Because of that, the Public Disaster Task Force conduct 
disaster preparedness. The first step is to create an organizational structure to make the coordination parts easier. Then create a disaster management system that is easy and understand understandable to member, as well as preparing human resources so that they are ready to participate in handling national disaster. The organization the organizational structure of the public disaster task force is commanded by Dr. Donald and under his command are they divided uh, into two divisions, namely the support management division and the medical support division, where MI Hotma become chairman of the support management division. In support management in charge of the area of human resource, logistic, and also PR. Manuel, medical support in, is in charge of pre-hospital, hospital, and medical support chairs. The organizational structure of the disaster task force has also received legitimacy through the Central Committee of Public Degree decree regarding the establishment of the public disaster task force organizational. And the public disaster task force has also prepared the a team can move less than 24 hours to the disaster site. In preparing human resource, its brand is form a rapid response and assessment team. And at the central level, there is a PABI task force assistant team. All task force members are provided with training that support their that is in disaster management. Result of that, uh, from the result of the mapping of PABI members, Almost 200 surgeons are spread throughout Indonesia. So this will facilitate the mobilization of members to speed up disaster management through good coordination channel. Disaster management system has also been different. We are starting from pre-disaster, preparation has been met. During a disaster, a team, a team has been uh, formed and after the disaster management is finished, all parties are re-evaluated. These are all made so that there can be high uh, effectiveness and mobility in disaster management. In reporting disaster event, a good and fast reporting system has also been established so that the formation of a quick reaction team can be formed immediately and immediately moved. And this slide uh, to view the public disaster task force has also coordinated with related parties with and to facilitate coordination in the field. Among them are the Indonesian Ministry of Health and BNPB as well as making relationship with other related parties. This was uh, the audience for the public disaster task force and the Indonesian Ministry of Health, where the Minister of Health of the Republic of Indonesia was very enthusiastic and welcomed the formation of the public disaster task force. This was during um, this was the, during a meeting with uh, head of BNPB National Disaster Management Agency Indonesia, General Doni in Jakarta. The head of BNPB instructs the disaster system created by the PABI Disaster Task Force the, to be coordinated with the existing system in BNPB. So that the role of the public disaster task force would become stronger. 
We have also created the uh, uh, Pabi Disaster Management System Manual, which is used in disaster management by members. This is uh, the the book, manual book. This is an example of a disaster event reporting from before the team is deployed, so that we can know what equipment is being carried and also the number person the number of the uh, personnel to be deployed and how to transport to the disaster area that is a glimpse of the role of general surgeon brought the public organization in disaster management in indonesia hopefully this information can be useful for audience and also, I thank to the committee for giving me this presentation time. Then I return it to the moderator. Thank you, Dr. Tita. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hotba Bajarnahor, for your uh, interesting presentation. And now we come to the discussion session. Before opening the discussion to the floor, uh, I would like to give the opportunity first to uh, all the speakers to make an expertise discussion so uh, the speakers can ask questions to the other speakers so this is the discussion uh, inter speaker for the first opportunity i would like to give uh, this turn to dr cahya norobi to ask question to the other speakers dr robi uh, time is yours uh, thank you, Dr. Peter. I will ask to Dr. Hotma yeah, regarding your presentation. So, um, do you have a uh, how, how to um, train train for the um, your member? um especially for the sop this uh, the um the similar perceptions of the all the member in in indonesia how you uh, provide uh, the training thank you yeah please dr hotmat uh, react uh, the question of dr robi Time is yours. Thank you, Dr. Peter. Uh, okay, Dr. Robi, this is uh, Dr. Robi is my friend from instructor of ATLS. <laughs> okay, uh, from uh, the competi com uh, competency of the general surgeon, we have uh, competency about uh, DSTC. Why DSTC? Because DSTC is uh, used to stabilizing the uh, patient in trauma. So, <clears throat> so um, my uh, member of uh, Pabi, uh, we have a competency of the to uh, and APLS to uh, uh, use for disaster uh, management. That is Dr. Robi. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hotma. Uh, so, for the next opportunity, I will give the turn to Professor uh, Gregory Shilton to ask question to the other speaker. Uh, Professor Shilton, uh, time is yours. Thank you, Professor Manopo. Um, I'd like to ask Professor uh, uh, Nawabi, uh, on your presentation at the end, you talked about the need for civilian military collaboration, which I agree, I think it's a very important uh, area and one that we're exploring more uh, in my training program. Um, but do uh, in Indonesia, is there much joint training between uh, with civilian and military combined? Do you, do you train often with the, that in that area of civilian military collaboration? Please, Dr. Robi, react to the question. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Prof. Uh, Shiotun. Yes, uh, we have uh, it and every every year we have a uh, regular a training between civil, civilian and military regarding the uh, uh, disasters 
and we also have a, a training with the uh, other country for example the us uh, we we plan for uh, in 2020 actually we plan pacific partnership in uh, sibolga area between uh, tni us navy and also the civilian in in the uh, located area i mean it's in sibolga but um um actually uh, we have a pandemic situation so the the training should be cancelled to uh um next year or probably two next two years but we have a, a every every year we we have a a training for the civilian and military uh, for disaster response thank you dr robi uh, for the next opportunity i would like to invite uh, dr hotma to ask question to the other speakers uh, your the time is yours dr hotma okay thank you dr peter uh, i want to ask uh, prof george richard uh, how to uh, how to build the disaster team uh, in your country sorry how do we what in our country what is the question how, how do you with with the uh, uh, disaster team in your country how, how do i agree with it uh, yeah uh, uh, sorry uh, my signal is not good yeah it's a little bit soft sorry uh, would you please uh, repeat your question, Dr. Hotma? Maybe the internet connection is unstable. Yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, how how to you uh, training your train your training to your uh, team for uh, disaster team? Yes. Okay. Sorry. Um, so the disaster uh, system, the National Disaster Medical System, um, that these teams in the United States operate under have a full uh, training program. There are some online components to it. There are some hands-on components to it. So before a team member uh, is able to deploy, uh, before they're actually credentialed to deploy, they have to maintain a certain training um, uh, regimen and have completed a certain training, um, uh, a number of training programs. Uh, and then at that point, once they go through the training, then they're eligible for deployment on the teams. That training also has to be kept up um, during, uh, you know, uh, repeated and, and, and uh, have continuing education essentially um, in various aspects of providing austere um, medicine uh, in these disaster teams. So, so it's, a, it's a national program for the teams. And then there's also independent uh, training programs. Like I run a disaster medicine fellowship program at Harvard, um, Harvard Medical School, where we have physicians come, uh, spend a year with us, and we put them through specific disaster medicine training. That's a little bit more intense training. It's not specifically for disaster teams, it's disaster medicine in general. But the teams themselves maintain a training program um, that allows all the members then to be credentialed and be deployable um, if they have their credentials um, uh, up to date. Thank you, Professor Siotun. Uh, and now I will open the discussion to the floor. Is there any question from the floor to the speakers? You can uh, ask question directly. Dr. Peter, can I ask questions? Sure. Uh, please, Dr. Franz, the time is yours. Uh, I'd like to address my question to uh, Dr. Uh, 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 I'm sorry, uh, Gregory. Uh, I, 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 I forgive me for uh, uh, not able to pronounce your uh, last name. Uh, so, uh, how do you in the states? How do you maintain the the capability of your team and the accreditation? How do you accredit the team so it will be ready in any any disaster? And how do you divide the region? Uh, the state is very large. How do you divide the region of uh, who will be the first responder uh, on the uh, disaster? Yeah, so, so the teams are maintained um, by the, the National Disaster Medical System, which is part of the Department of Health and Human Services. So it's a governmental entity that, that you know, makes sure that the system uh, is maintained. 
each individual team um, also maintains their personnel. So once members are, uh, once they apply, um, they're accepted into the system and placed on a team, then each team maintains their personnel and make sure again, as I said, everybody has gone through the training to be deployable. Um, and when we first started the National Disaster Medical System, I, uh, my team, Massachusetts too, was one of the first teams. Uh, the first team started about 1989, um, 1990. Uh, and the first deployment was actually Hurricane Andrew in Florida, that first deployment of the National Disaster Medical System. Um, but at that time, and, and actually the time that I uh, commanded the team at Ground Zero on 9-11, there were about 15 level one teams in the United States. Now that there are over 40 uh, DMAT teams in the United States, so they're, they're, they've grown um, tremendously. Uh, and they're in almost every state, not every state, but almost every state. And some states, of course, have more than one. Uh, and the way that we um, uh, deploy is every team, every level one team is on high alert. I'm sorry, is on alert. So it could be deployed at any time. But just prior to 9-11, actually several months before 9-11, we divided the United States up into three sections. So the eastern seaboard, the western seaboard, and the middle portion of the United States. And we designated one team, <clears throat> one level one DMAT team, to be on high alert for each one of those regions uh, for that month. And it just so happens that September of 2001, my team, Massachusetts too, was on high alert, high alert for the Eastern Seaboard. So anything from you know Maine and, and Boston, Massachusetts, you know down through New York, Washington D.C., and down to Florida, we would be the, the first team out the door. Um, though other teams would would also be deployed if needed. So for instance, in 9/11, we were activated first, but we had two other DMAT teams join us um, uh, down at uh, Ground Zero, Massachusetts one and uh, Rhode Island one. So the three of us were there at the same time. Um, so, but that's, that's so, essentially how we deploy. Yes. So, uh, uh, so it means that you are professionally uh, attached to a team, but yes. every day you are doing you are not uh, you are doing other work. Exactly. Yeah. So, and that, <laughs> so that, that's 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 by design. That that is how the National Disaster Medical System was designed because. Um, prior to that, the, the onus of disaster response was almost primarily on military, so the National Guard and, and you know, the different military assets. Now, we still have National Guard involvement in disasters, and, we, and the military is still uh, very good, you know, great logisticians and logistics and military is, is like none other. They're, they're excellent. Um, so there's still, and there's a liaison between the National Disaster Medical System and the Department of Defense here in the United States. But you're exactly right, and that was by that was by design, so that <clears throat> because disasters are, you know, they're they're low frequency but high acuity events. Um, uh, what you know, disaster team members do, like doctors, like myself, or nurses or paramedics, is they do their their regular work every day. In the event of a disaster, they're activated and they deploy. Um, so there's a few things put into place for that. One is that um, if a uh, DMAT member is deployed. Um, they have to be guaranteed their job when they get back. So then they have to, we have to go for two weeks. We always commit for two weeks. So meaning they can't be fired, you know, because they have to go. The job has to allow them to come back. But the other thing that's more important is there is something called backfill pay. So if I were to be deployed for my team, so I'm now an ER doctor that leaves my hospital and I go off to a disaster. Um, the money that it takes the hospital to replace me for that two weeks um, uh, should come from my salary because I'm off salary then for the two weeks. If there's any more money required, meaning it would cost more to get somebody to replace me for that two weeks, the U.S. government will pay that. It's called backfill pay. So the idea is to make a, 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 a zero financial impact on your place of employment. So there are certain parameters that are put into place like that. But, it, but it's never easy to deploy um, because we have to deploy within eight hours. We have to be out the door and going to the disaster. And that's difficult. We have to commit to two weeks. So that's mm -hmm. difficult. And that's why typically teams have many more people on the team than actually deploy. So at the time of, of 9-11, I had about 200 people on my team um, and 50, we brought 54 down to ground zero because not everybody can go all the time, so. Thank you, Thank Professor. You yeah, Professor. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Any other question from the floor? <laughs> Professor Siotun, I have a question for you. Yes. Uh, uh, is my uh, voice clear? Because 
my internet connection un is unstable. Yes, that's clear. I can, I can hear you. Uh, okay. <clears throat> uh, based on your experience uh -huh. so far, uh, to what extent could the civilian people like uh, fishermen or farmer contribute in a coastal disaster or a mountain mm -hmm. disaster because uh, they will be the first person who know this uh, disaster yes that's a great question so that that um uh is uh leads to the idea that i i put forth in my presentation about building local capacity um, so because the acute phase of the disaster really uh, is not the time when you'll be able to get outside resources in, you really, it's a very, very important to build local capacity. The way you build local capacity is on different levels. So the healthcare system, the physicians, the nurses, and others um, in the healthcare system should all have some capabilities um, for that, low, that, that immediate or acute response. And that's why I say, uh, when, I, when I teach and I lecture around the world, I say everybody in healthcare should know just a little bit about disaster medicine. Because if a disaster happens near you, you're going to be the only response for the first one, two, maybe three days, typically. Okay. Now, what you're speaking about is the, is the, the citizenry, the, 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 the um, lay people, let's say, the citizens, non-medical people. Um, in that case, there also should you know, be in place some degree of training um, and at least some degree of understanding of what to do in a disaster. In the United States, we have something called CERT teams or CERT, CERT, I'm sorry, community emergency response teams. And while some of these do have medical personnel on them, others have people with no medical background, but are, are trained and taught just a little bit of, of what we call first responder um, type of medicine. Very minor things, but things that they can do in a disaster. And then finally, educating your public the community on what they should do to help themselves and help their family and help their friends in the event of a disaster. You know, these are things like when a tsunami warning happens, where do you go? What's the exit route? Um, you know, understanding what to do in the event of a disaster. So there's different layers of how we prepare. Um, but I believe and, uh, and continue to, to talk about the need for local um, capacity building, particularly in island nations, right? So we, we have responded to the Haiti earthquake and, you know, the Caribbean is so close that we have a lot of experience in the United States with, with island nations and hurricanes that occur and earthquakes that occur in high island nations. And island nations, when I talk about 48 to 72 hours before outside um, assistance can come in, in island nations, it's, it's usually a lot more than that. Um, it's just more difficult to get to islands. <clears throat> and in the same light, it's more difficult to evacuate island as well. So there, it's a very vulnerable population when you talk about island nations, as you well know. Uh, thank you, Professor Siotun. I have the second question for you. Uh, have WADM an operational body or task force uh, to involve directly on the site of disaster? No, WADM does not have an operational arm. Um, uh, WADM is the oldest uh, society in the world in disaster and emergency medicine. WADM was established uh, 1975-76. Um, and uh, has been in existence ever since, but it's from the very beginning has been uh, established to be a resource um, for uh, practitioners uh, in disaster medicine, emergency medicine, but also all aspects of healthcare, researchers, scientists. It's a way to bring um, uh, research and education and training uh, together under one roof. The, the, re the overarching idea of WADM is to try to um, bridge, bridge that gap between research and academics and operations. So try to get as much information and cutting edge information out um, to people uh, who operate. And typically um, the, the members of WADM also are, are disaster medicine practitioners, meaning they also um, uh, respond to disasters and they're on disaster teams and they do emergency preparedness. So they are, uh, individuals are operational, but WADM itself is not operational. Thank you, uh, Professor Siotun, for your answer. Uh, is there any question from the floor? Yes, question. Hello. Yeah, uh, sure. Uh, please uh, introduce and uh, introduce yourself and uh, address the question. 
Yes. How are you? Yeah. How are you, Professor? You can ask the question directly. Uh, sorry that uh, the internet connection is unstable. Can you repeat the question, please? Good afternoon. This Dr. Daniel. Is this Dr. Daniel? Okay. Sorry, the network is unstable. Um, I want to congratulate the speakers um, for the wonderful presentations. Yes, excuse me, Dr. Cook, Daniel Cook from Nigeria. Here in Nigeria. Yes, please uh, repeat the question, Dr. Daniel Kokong from Nigeria. Hello. Yes, can you repeat the question, please? Because uh, your voice is uh, not clear by the unstable connection. Hello. Okay, uh, I'll skip maybe later on. Dr. Daniel uh, can ask the question. Uh, any other question from the floor? Uh, Dr. Peter. Yes, uh, Dr. Robi, uh, please. Yeah, probably uh, Dr. Daniel can ask uh, by um, write the, the question in, in the chat box so we can read the questions clearly. Yeah, that's a good idea. Um, while waiting for the uh, connection, I would like to ask question to Dr. Robi. Yeah, please, Dr. Peter. Yeah, uh, based on your experience so far, if there is any disaster in Indonesia and uh, the reaction from TNE will be a combined team uh, between the Army, the Navy, and the Air Force, or uh, only one team will involve? Yeah, ideally, we uh, deploy the combined team. But uh, sometimes, um, it, in if the uh, disasters located in the near naval base, for example. So the uh, the team from Navy should be the first team will come to the uh, uh, located area in the in the first time. But uh, in the in the meantime, we prepare the backup uh, from either from uh, Jakarta or either from uh, Surabaya using a Hercules C1-180, um, this combined team from uh, Army, Navy, and Air Force. Uh, that's my answer, Dr. Peter. Uh, thank you, Dr. Robi, for your answer. Any other question from the floor? Uh, Dr. Peter, yeah. may I ask one question to all the uh, Sure, speakers? sure, so, the time is yours. Uh, uh, as you know, that disaster is unpredictable, but it is a high, high cost actually in uh, managing it. So, how do you procure, or who will procure the fundings for all of the preparations and training and uh, staff for any disaster? Because uh, maybe it is not you cannot budget for the disaster. 
right like for right now uh, we have a COVID-19 and everybody uh, the government is running to get uh, enough more money to fund the vaccine and everything so for natural disasters it's not predictable and so how do you uh, manage the the fundings uh, i i'd like to to get the uh, information from uh, dr chahya uh, professor gregory and also uh, dr hotma how do you manage the funding to be prepared only to be prepared it's uh, and maintain the team you need money right so how do you plan to uh, how you how are you doing this <laughs> this is a, a logistic problem i think thank you uh, please uh, professor siotone you will be the first who will react well that, that's always the eternal struggle right trying to find funding for again these things that are low frequency high acuity events but it's a matter of now, I'm not talking about teams, I'm just talking about disaster preparedness in general, of which teams are part of that. Um, but it's a matter of trying to convince those who do fund these, um, um, uh, you know, this preparedness, uh, that it's an important thing to do because uh, the, in my mind, as a physician, as surgeons, physicians, you know, we um, provide care, we provide service to, to citizens. We have a patient population, we have a community, we provide um, important medical care to them. Uh, uh, in the same light, disasters are um, a threat to citizens. They cause uh, traumatic injuries. They cause can cause you know long term medical problems. All these things. So, in the same light of our our um, obligation to provide health care to citizens on on a normal daily basis, I believe we also should be. Um, the, the onus should be on us to provide that care in these um, uh, high, high acuity events, these disaster events. Um, so I think, I mean, money should be set aside for this. And in the same light, you know, I, I like to use the, the um, uh, equate this with um, walking onto an airplane, right? What allows us to get onto an airplane, fly at 35,000 feet in the air for six, seven, eight hours, and rest and sleep comfortably? Um, in that very dangerous, potentially dangerous situation. What allows us to <clears throat> do that, to feel comfortable doing that, and which therefore enables the entire industry, is our confidence that the, the pilots have done disaster preparedness. They have practiced countless thousands of hours on low frequency, high acuity events. They may never see one of these events their entire career, but if one does happen, they are prepared to respond. And because we feel comfortable that they're prepared, we can rest comfortably on an airplane and not be um, worried about uh, disaster. Um, in the same sense, I think the disaster preparedness needs to be looked at that way. So the funding should be provided. It's never easy, never easy, um, but it should it should be provided. Thank you, Professor Siotun. For the next, uh, please, uh, Dr. Robbie to react. Yeah, this is a, a interesting questions because uh, TNI every year has a uh, budget problems regarding for the disaster response. Until now, TNI don't have the special budget for disaster response. So by law uh, say that B BNPB has the budget. So when we uh, deploy our uh, team to the uh, disaster area, so actually, uh, BNPB, uh, 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 what do you call it? Uh, <laughs> uh, will pay to to TNI in the in the next next month or next year, something something like that. Yeah. So it, it will be reimbursed, reimbursed yes. by the BNPB. Yes, you're right. So, yeah. Okay. So actually, TNI don't have a budget for the disaster response. A disaster mitigation to the community, so we don't have a budget. But uh, by uh, coordinating with the BNPB, or probably from uh, the uh, Ministry of Health, the crisis uh, uh, department of the Ministry of Health, so we can uh, deal the uh providing the uh medications providing the um uh training of the of the uh, personnel something like that 
Thank you, Dr. Robi. Yeah, thank you. Uh, please, Dr. Hotma, it's, uh, the time is yours. Okay, thank you. Uh, if you talk, uh, ask to me, uh, do you have money? I don't have money and my team don't have money. <laughs> so uh, the, the budget in my team is, is uh, from the <coughs> uh, central committee from PABI. So, so we, we just to start the disaster team. So we need a um, uh, budget from the central committee. That's Dr. Arvin. Okay, thank you, Dr. Hotma, yeah, for your you answer. All the speakers. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Franz. Uh, any other question from the floor? Yes, I have one. My name is Ray Dieter. I'm past president of ICS. And yes, I'd like please. to ask Dr. Satone, what should the individual, the community person, do in preparation if there should ever be a, a disaster? So again, if this is a non-healthcare person, really, it's it's um, if that's what you're referring to, it's the um, it's the education, it's the community education that's required. So uh, it, you know, it's very similar to what is happening with COVID-19, right? So uh, these non-pharmaceutical interventions that we have to do to bridge ourselves from when a novel um, virus emerges to um, to the point when we have um, effective vaccines and therapeutics um, is, is this idea of the community healing itself, essentially. So the social distancing, the mask wearing, et cetera, that's community education. Um, you know, a pandemic is a disaster just like any other disaster. It may not be, as I call it, a lights and sirens disaster like mass casualty incidents, um, but it's more of a, a public health um, disaster that, that lasts a long, a long period of time. But the community must be educated to do what is necessary um, to stop the spread of the virus, right? So that's all community preparedness. It's it's all about education. So it means that that leaders, um, policymakers, um, disaster medicine leaders, healthcare personnel um, need to try to do everything they can to educate the public. Now, so that's the that's the citizenry. Um, that's the non you know the lay people. Let's say layman, um, non healthcare person. How to um, protect themselves, protect their families in the event of a disaster, what to do in the event of a disaster. So in this case, in COVID-19, it's the social distancing, it's the mask wearing, et cetera. And something else, like perhaps a uh, earthquake and tsunami, a tsunami warning goes off, you know, it's how do you evacuate? Where do you go? Um, but then also there's the idea of what we use here in the United States of um, community or emergency response teams. Um, these are community-based um, teams of personnel, some have healthcare backgrounds, a lot don't. Um, and they're actually trained to a certain first responder type of a level, uh, disaster first responder type of a level, so that not only do they know what to do to care for themselves, but how they can help in the community, care for their, their neighbors, let's say, in, in the community. So it's all, it, it, to, to answer the question very broadly, it's all about education. It's community education um, that should be coming from policymakers, healthcare personnel, um, disaster preparedness and response people. Thank you, Thank Professor you. Situn. Yep. Any other question from the floor? Uh, yes. Um, good afternoon, sir. Is it uh, from uh, Dr. Daniel from Nigeria? Yes. How Maybe. are you, sir? Uh, I'm fine. Uh, maybe it's better if you write the question uh, in the thank chat you. box. Yes, thank you. Dr. Yes, Daniel, I, can you hear you my voice? For this opportunity to, uh, yeah. for this opportunity to, to speak on this forum, I want to congratulate uh, I want to congratulate. Yes, I can hear you very clearly. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, yes, yes. I can hear you now. Yeah, please ask the question. Yes, yes. I want to congratulate all the speakers. Uh, Professor Hotman, um, Professor Siotone. Anne and Robbie for the wonderful presentations. Uh, I just have a few observations on um, the team for 
disaster relief care. Um, I saw as if there were just uh, general surgeons. Uh, don't you think we need um, a combination of specialists like cardiothoracic surgeons, neurosurgeons, so that we can have a holistic uh, approach to the care, including the ENT surgeon, as part of the team for the care on victims from disasters. Hello? Yes. So, uh, yes. is that your question? Okay. Uh, so, please, I will give the opportunity to answer this question to each speaker. The first is to Dr. Robby. Please, Dr. Robby. I'm sorry, Dr. Peter, because the uh, question is not too clear for me. It's about the question is about uh, the team of the disaster, disaster relief. Is it uh, the combination of all uh, specialists or only limited for uh, some specialists? Okay. Uh, let me explain. In the in the first uh, deployment, we usually the uh, uh, general practitioner without specialist. But after after we we provide the hospital field, so the specialist uh, doctor will deploy after the the hospital field um, um, uh, operate. So probably until uh, 24 or 72 hours after the first deployment. Thank you, Dr. Robi. Uh, Professor Siotun, uh, will you react uh, to this question? Yeah, so I, I think that um, the question is asking whether specialists, very specialized surgeons, um, should be part of the teams. I believe that was the question. Um, I think uh, the delineation should really be made on whether to build in surgical capability to your team or not. And if you look at the, um, again, the United Nations WHO emergency medical teams, there are different levels of teams. So one team is a level much like the DMAT teams in the United States, where it's really just emergency medicine capability. Another level of team has that surgical and ICU capability. So I think the delineation should be made at that point, at that level, do we build surgical and ICU capability into our team or not? And there's different roles for each team. Um, and then you should also have, because uh, uh, no, really almost no team can be completely self-sufficient. Some of the more advanced teams can be fairly self-sufficient for a period of time, but at some point you're gonna need to have definitive care. So you need to make sure that um, whether it's the military logistics or your logistical capabilities do have the ability to take patients from your field team to definitive care. And I think it's at that step where you need to build in some of your specialized um, surgical capabilities. For instance, neurosurgical capability. Um, I, I think others that he was listing, um, cardiothoracic, let's say. Um, but I think a trauma, you know, general surgeon, trauma surgeon is probably the one that should be in the advanced team, the field team. And then, but have that capability of, of logistically bring patients to more definitive care and maybe more specialized surgical care. Uh, thank you, Professor Siotun. Uh, for the next, uh, Dr. Hotma, please uh, answer the question of Dr. Daniel Kongkong from Nigeria. Sorry, uh, Dr. Peter, I don't. Uh, the question, uh, the question is about uh, the team of disaster relief. This uh, consists of uh, many specialists or some specialists. Okay, uh, my team is uh, consists to the stabilizing the patient in a uh, victim, so the <coughs> not in the SAR. So uh, that's the that's the answer, yeah. Only uh, from the SAR, SAR team. Yeah. Or oh, not SAR? Okay. Thank okay. you, Doctor Hotma. Uh, Doctor Daniel Kong Kong from Nigeria, uh, is your question answered?
Yeah. Any other question from the floor? This is a I question in the chat. Sorry. I have a question, Dr. Peter. Oh, yes. Please, uh, Professor Handy. Yes. Uh, thank you for the interesting presentation from all participants. Uh, I have a question. Is there any rule to, on how long the disaster team work in disaster area? Because working too long is will be a tired and causing ineffective work. Thank you. So this this question is uh, for uh, which speaker? I don't know. All the speaker maybe. How long all the, the, all the disaster speaker. team? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. The first uh, I will give the opportunity to Dr. Robbie. How long this disaster team will work uh, to avoid the fatigue condition or tired condition? Yes, um, <clears throat> we, we actually we don't have the um, SOP about 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 that uh, how long. But um, in my experience, if the the disaster is prolonged, we usually take one month at least. Uh, we have to change with other team. But uh, that depends on the situations of the disaster. For example, in, in, in the uh, natural disaster, with where the, every uh, building or every uh, logistic will be um, limited, so probably we can um, shorten, shorten the, the time. But if the um, facility still um, occur, so we can longer. I think that's my uh, comment for answer. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Robi. Uh, Professor Shiotun, uh, please uh, react to the question. Time is yours. Yes, yeah, so uh, the, the disaster system, National Disaster Medical System in the United States, and the DMAT teams or disaster medical assistance teams our, our, our field teams have a limit of two weeks deployment. So after 14 days, the team will be removed. Um, and if, if there's still a need, another team will come in and backfill them. And this is what I said occurred at ground zero 911. Um, my team stayed for two weeks and then we left and other teams came and, and um, uh, continue the deployment for two weeks. And actually, the, the National Disaster Medical System maintained field teams at Ground Zero 9-11 up until the first week of November. So they were there for a long time. But each individual team was two weeks. Now, again, the DMAT teams, the, the system is set up to be deploying only to within the United States. So they are domestic, the federal teams to be deployed domestically, not internationally. Uh, the DMAT teams do go to U.S. territories. Um, they've gone to Guam. Um, uh, we've gone to Puerto Rico. Um, but for the most part, it's domestic deployments. So it's a shorter, you know, it's easier transport, transport time. It's, it's not very far away, right? The international teams have to typically go much further away. So it may be that it's more, um, it makes more sense and it's, it's better to deploy for a longer period of time. As Dr. Mirabi said, you know, a one month deployment, I think is not unusual for an international team. But the DMAT system, the, the, the DMAT teams in the United States um, deploy for two weeks. Thank you, Professor Shiotun. Uh, Dr. Hotma, uh, please react to the question. Uh, time is yours. Okay, uh, from this uh, Pabi <coughs> Sasper Task Force, we, uh, we just, uh, uh, first, term, first, first thing is uh, five day uh, first to upload a uh, disaster. Uh, after the five day, uh, we re-evaluated, uh, uh, we, we uh, send a team the next or no, uh, like this. So uh, we have uh, uh, time is uh, five day. Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Hotma. Thank you. Uh, there, is, there is a question, uh, uh, Professor Handy, is your question answered? Yes, thank you very okay. much for all speaker. Okay, uh, so I'll proceed to the next question from the chat box from Dr. Henny. Uh, 
the question is about the training for the civilian people to react as the first party to any disaster. Maybe uh, the first for reacting this question is to Dr. Robbie. Please, Dr. Robbie. Yeah. The responsibility for uh, training the community actually in Indonesia that regarding the what kind of the training. For example, if a, a community train for the mitigations of disaster, so I think BN, BNPB is the responsible for that. But if the uh, training about the how to uh, take care of the victims, so Ministry of Health will has a responsible for that. But then how, how the TNI uh, responsible to the community? Because uh, TNI don't have a responsible to, to train the community about the how to uh, uh, as a first responder. So you, we usually uh, together with the BNPB or the MOH to train the uh, community. That's my answer. Thank you, Dr. Robbie. Professor Siotun, uh, the time is yours to react for this question. Yeah, so in the United States, uh, first responder training uh, is done. There's a, cur a curriculum that was put together by the National um, Transportation Safety Board. And that is a uh, uh, training program and first responder um, that's updated, I think, every three, four, five years, something like that. Um, and that's, again, put up by the NTSB. FEMA, our Federal Emergency Management Agency, also has a number of uh, training programs, online training programs uh, that are easily accessible and, and can uh, provide uh, all levels of training, not just in, in a first responder type of training, but they provide incident command system or command and control training and some other, other areas. So, um, you know, there's, and there's, there are other more um, uh, uh, specialized uh, training programs as well, and also some private uh, programs. But for the most part, it's the NTSB, National Transportation Safety Board's first responder curriculum that is used most often. Thank you, Professor Siotun. Uh, Dr. Hotma, uh, time is yours to react to this question. Dr. Hotma. Okay, uh, we have we have one opportunity to the question from the floor. Any question from the floor? The last question. If there is no question, uh, uh, we come uh, to the end of this discussion, and I would like to invite Professor Puruhito to uh, deliver the evaluation of this chapter and uh, the end notes. Professor Purhito, the time is yours. Thank you, Dr. Peter. Uh, can everybody hear my voice? Yes, clearly. Yeah. Okay. Good evening to all Indonesian and Asian uh, listeners. Good day to those coming from Middle East and good morning to our colleagues from US and European countries. Uh, first of all, I would like to appreciate the effort of ICS Indonesian Surgical Forum Chapter 10, and this time in webinar on disaster relief. Uh, for your information, Dr. Max Dohan, the ICS Indonesian section has been very active in pursuing upgrading courses for Indonesian surgeons and also for surgeons from other countries. Uh, talking about uh, disaster relief and disaster management, I would like to make some notes as follows. First, the disaster management is a multidisciplinary teamwork. And in each country, there is always uh, the so-called Disaster Management Act or system. And in Indonesia, such act and disaster management plan has been clearly explained by Dr. Robi and Dr. Banjar Nahor, uh, uh, representing military as well as uh, general surgical practices. Uh, thank you very much to Dr. Chiotun from US, who has uh, thank, uh, shared his experiences, uh, what has happened uh, in uh, management of disaster in US. Uh, secondly, 
in each disaster, I believe, be it man-made or natural, is always a huge financial loss to the country. It is seen that the losses due to natural health disaster are 20 times greater, uh, this is percentage of GDP, in developing countries than in industrialized countries. And also, almost 95% of disaster-related deaths take place in developing countries. In natural disasters, such as earthquakes, floods, storm, or even tsunamis, I think the team should focus on immediate threat to life, namely the provision of uh, the four immediate determinants of survival. It is water, food, shelter, and sanitation. But on the other hand, man-made disasters, such as wars or terrorist attacks, has taken the life of innumerable individuals throughout the history. Of course, unnatural has disasters includes also biological disaster. The sur surgeons has a natural ability to lead the teams. And an emergent situation is where a surgeon is able to demonstrate controlled decision making under stressful condition. However, technically, operating in disaster zone is not the same as working in our usual working place. Surgeon's competence and sometimes creative or innovative ability in a situation where there is a limited success is highly needed. The immediate surgical response is aimed towards the acute trauma care of the injured, while a later response focuses on rehabilitation of surgical of, uh, surfaces in the disaster zone. And based on rapid needs assessment, the deploying agency plan the timing of deployment teams. It is the mixture of surgical skills, orthopedics, cardiothoracic surgeon, abdominal surgeon, or neurosurgeons within each team, and the need for other skills of competences, such, such as critical care, dialysis, or obstetrics, even pediatrics. Uh, the fourth is the WHO has endorsed a disaster management guidelines and emergency surgical care in this situation. In this regard, military teams should be involved in every kind of disaster, and sometimes they have to take over the leadership. So to summarize, I would like to say that a comprehensive education and training strategic plan from capacity building in disaster medicine should be continuously pursued at the basic level, is of course what Dr. Chioton has uh, explained, a community education and training of bystanders. That's all what I like to say. Thank you very much for the opportunity to give me the opportunity to deliver this message. Thank you, Dr. Peter. Peter. Dr. Peter, your microphone is still muted. Oh, uh, pardon. Uh, I would like to express my gratitude to Professor Puruhito for the evaluation notes. Professor Puruhito is the expertise board of the ICS uh, Indonesia section. And now I would like to uh, invite Professor Siotone to uh, deliver your chapter uh, impression. Professor Sutton, the time is yours. Well, again, thank you so much for having me speak at this very important conference. Um, it's, it, it is very encouraging to see um, an international um, uh, you know, uh, College of Surgeons chapter um, be this concerned, so concerned about disaster response to take the time um, to gather and to have speakers and to discuss this very important problem. Um, as uh, Dr. Perito, uh, Professor Perito mentioned, um, this is a very important uh, issue that's going to require um, uh, very um, uh, uh, important, but also um, regulated and 
um, uh, designed education and training for each of our specialties, our healthcare specialties. Surgeons bring a certain uh, capacity to disaster relief. Other types of physicians bring a certain capability and capacity to, to disaster relief. Other healthcare professionals, nurses, um, uh, sometimes paramedics and, and other, um, um, each have a role, each serve a purpose. Um, and it's really when we come together in forums like this and we discuss these issues and discuss how to respond to disasters is how then we make a more efficient response. Uh, the other important thing to understand, I think also is that uh, disaster response, particularly the way disaster teams are put together and prepare uh, and respond to disasters is very different depending on where you are and, and what your system is that you work under. So one of the things I teach my disaster medicine fellows all the time is that because we have an international fellowship, so we have 10 to 12 fellows that come from all over the world. And I say to them, you're going to learn a lot about disaster medicine. Um, we're going to teach you you know, how we do disaster medicine in the United States. We'll talk about and teach how we do disaster medicine in other parts of the world. But always understand that you cannot take a system, uh, as we say, a cookie cutter um, impression of that system and then put it down uh, in another place and have it work effectively. You need to pull the different uh, uh, pieces of the puzzle uh, from your experience and from your education and then build a system that works most effectively where you are um, in the community that you are and where you practice. And I think that's very, very important. Um, that, along with training and education, I think are probably the, the real um, pillars of uh, disaster preparedness and response, how to do that effectively. Um, and I, one thing I'd like to say also is it's better the planning than the plan. I'm not so concerned that we have a disaster plan for a certain situation. Um, I'm more concerned that we've gone through the planning um, uh, phase, that we've gone through the activities around education, training, and drilling together, the planning piece, because regardless of what disaster plan you might have, um, all disasters will always follow a non-linear path. Um, your disaster plan may have a, a linear path of how to respond to a certain kind of disaster, but I can tell you, and I'm sure all of you have been in different disasters and crises, you know that disasters always take a left-hand turn and a right-hand turn, and you have to veer from your plan probably many times. And it's that capability, that ability to pivot when the disaster pivots, that's most important. And that is done through the planning piece of disaster preparedness. And that's part of what we, we did here today. So thank you again. Um, it's been a very informative um, um, Congress and, and forum, and I appreciate you having me speak. Thank you very much, Professor Siotun, for your uh, impressions. And I would like to invite uh, Mr. Max Downham to deliver the impression of the head office of the International College of Surgeons. Uh, Mr. Donham, the time is yours. Uh, Dr. Manopo, thank you so much. Um, the, I, I will be very brief and make two very general observations. Number one uh, is the, it strikes me as uh, listening to these excellent presentations uh, that amount a, a considerable amount of sacrifice is involved by the people who are involved in these various teams and, and disaster relief endeavors and so um, I, as we say in this country and i'm a uh, i served 10 years in the u.s navy in the earlier parts of my life that um, uh, as we say thank you for your service uh, to all of the people involved uh, with the speakers and all others uh, involved. It's, it's, uh, that speaks to commitment. The commitment is fantastic um, because I, I'm sure that uh, they do it joyfully, but the people involved uh, to be ready on short notice to go to a disaster area, uh, it speaks to commitment. And uh, so again, thank you for your service. Uh, number two, as Dr. Or Professor uh, Pirohito uh, indicated, the Indonesian section, for those on the line who may not know, is, is simply outstanding uh, in terms of its uh, humanitarian surgery endeavors uh, in and around Indonesia. And uh, I can only therefore emphasize to those who may not know on the line what an excellent uh, uh, Indonesian section leadership and involvement of all the fellows uh, in terms of disaster relief. So Dr. Manopo, I, I can only hope, as I always say, that other sections uh, in the ICS will 
do what uh, you and your leadership are doing. Uh, it's, it's simply phenomenal. And uh, on behalf of Professor um, Zufas and the leadership of the International Parent Body, we really thank you and the section for all of your excellent efforts. And again, uh, it was a, just a privilege and honor to listen to these speakers. So thank you, Dr. Van Opel. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Max Dalham from the ICS headquarter. And now we come to the end of this session. On behalf of the ICS Indonesian section, I would like to express my gratitude to all participants, particularly uh, the speaker, Professor Siotun, Dr. Jayan Robi, Dr. Hotma Banjarnahor, uh, Professor Jojur Surfas, Mr. Max Downham, uh, Professor Hendi Hendarto, uh, Professor Puruhito, Dr. Franciscus Arifin, and our IT team, Mr. Bimo and Ms. Uh, Dewi. Uh, goodbye, everyone, and have a nice weekend and stay healthy. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. See you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Bye, all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Robby. Atma. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye-bye. Yeah. Yeah. Terima kasih. Thank you, uh, Dr. Daniel Konko yeah. from Nigeria. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Goodbye, all. Thank you. Thank you.